folks, and welcome to the screencast in which I'll talk about life. In particular, what it means to be living and something called the diversity and the unity of life. What do we mean by diversity? Well, you've obviously noticed that there are lots of different kinds of living things in the world. Each different kind is known as a species. These are designated by their ability to interbreed and have fertile offspring. In contrast, you'll learn about the unity of life. All life shares particular characteristics, and one of the most interesting of these is that all living things share a common genetic code. We've attempted to show this unity in the tree of life that shows an interconnectedness of organisms to one another, and presumably each of these species evolved from one common ancestor over billions of years. All of these species have been organized in three very general categories to help us see their relatedness. The largest group are the eubacteria, otherwise known as just bacteria. They share similar cell structures to another domain called the archibacteria. Both these groups have similar cell structures that lack a nucleus that's enclosed in a membrane. We call these types of cells prokaryotes. However, genetically speaking, the archibacteria show more sim similarity to the eukarya. These are a diverse group of more complex organisms whose cells do have a membrane-bound nucleus and other complex structures. This group includes animals, plants, fungi, and single-celled proteases. Another way of organizing organisms is using the Six Kingdom system developed by Carolus Linnaeus in the 1700s. We'll learn more on his classification system later this year. So how do we determine if something is alive or not? Well, if NASA claims that they've discovered life on Mars or any other distant planet, are there some guidelines that will help us know for sure if what, they've, if what we have is a living thing? It turns out there are. We're going to list seven of them. Now, the funny thing is, some biologists will narrow this list down to three characteristics, while others will stretch it out to nine. However, the important thing is that we all agree that any list of characteristics is at least not contradictory to the other. First, all living things use a coded set of living instructions called deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA. They also use ribonucleic acid, RNA, along with DNA as instructions for making proteins. It is the protein that is essentially builds organism and runs life processes. This DNA-RNA protein relationship is known as the central dogma of biology. The term dogma refers to how things work, basically. Second, all organisms use energy in a process called metabolism. This is defined as all the chemical reactions in an organism. We can group organisms by the way in which they obtain their energy. Autotrophs are producers of chemical energy. They can capture pure energy like light and use it to assemble inorganic compounds such as carbon dioxide and water into a chemical food source such as glucose. Heterotrophs must consume other organisms in order to obtain their energy. Third is that organisms respond to stimuli. Stimuli are simply changes in an organism's environment. This is an important function of life because organisms must maintain certain limits in order to stay alive. For example, plants need specific amount of light and will grow toward it. Humans and other animals must keep relative stable body temperature. Anything an organism does to maintain stability is called homeostasis. Fourth, life remains organized despite all the energy it takes in. It's a natural tendency for non-living systems to become less organized as energy flows through them. Life seems to not obey this rule. It uses energy to make complex structures. When an organism dies, these structures fall apart. Fifth, all organisms grow and develop. To grow, organisms simply add more cells through cell division known as mitosis. Development is different from growth. As organisms mature, they also develop or change. For example, you're not simply a larger version of your baby self. Your arms and legs have grown longer, and you are born with a large 
head relative to the rest of your body. That's changed too. Sixth, organisms reproduce in one way or another. This is done either sexually with male and female sex cells or asexually when an, or when an individual organism copies itself to make another. And finally, number seven, all living things are made up of one or more cells. Single-celled organisms are also called unicellular, while those with two or more cells are called multicellular. We'll learn that there are two basic types of cells that are classified based on their complexity. There are prokaryotic cells that do not have complex organelles or a membrane around their nucleus. Prokaryotic organisms are always unicellular and include all bacteria and archaebacteria. Eukaryotic cells have complex organelles, an inner membrane system, and membrane, a membrane-bound nucleus. Organisms in the plant, animal, fungi, and protease kingdoms all have eukaryotic cells. One last thing to remember about these characteristics. A thing must possess all of these characteristics in order to be considered living. We'll have some discussion in class about how some things can have several of these characteristics but fall short of being called a living thing. Well, that's it for now. If I went too fast, rewind, pause to take notes, and have any questions ready for discussion when we meet in class. Until then, have a good day.